Hi, my name is Jackie Broder. I'm the director of the Mamakating Environmental Education and Interpretive Center. Welcome to our PowerPoint, Life of the Bashakil. Normally you'd be watching this here at the center with me and we'd be able to talk about things that you see in the PowerPoint or down at the wetland, but unfortunately we can't do that right now. So I thought I'd make this video so you can watch it at home and then maybe visit the Bashakil with your family. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write them below in the comments section, or you can visit our Facebook page at Mamakating Environmental Education and Interpretive Center. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I'd also love to see any drawings or pictures that, you take, that you've taken of wildlife in your backyard or down at the Bashakil, anywhere in the area. So I hope you enjoy the video and let's get started. The Bashakil is a 3,107 acre wildlife management area, which is comprised of the largest freshwater wetland in southeastern New York. Its 1,920 acre wetland is home to over 200 species of birds, thousands uh, during migration. The rest of the acreage subsists of chestnut oak forest, as well as ponds, fields, marshes, and swamps. Its name originates from two different cultures. Kill is the Dutch word for stream. The Dutch were one of the first European nations to settle here. And Basha was the name of a Lenape princess who was also a very powerful sachem or medicine woman. She and her village lived on these banks because of the plethora of medicinal plants that grew here naturally. A wildlife management area is designated for wildlife management, wildlife habitat management, and wildlife dependent recreation. It is not a preserve or refuge. This means that the land is protected for plants and animals to live on, but that hunting, fishing, and trapping are allowed. Kayaking and canoeing and miles of trails through the forested uplands that surround the wetland provide a peaceful setting where one can enjoy the life found there. The Bashakil is a very important ecosystem for storing flood water, cleansing and purifying groundwater, and furnishing habitat or homes for lots of different kinds of plants and animals. And it also provides a good place for people to have fun. We're gonna talk about some of the life that lives there today. Does anybody know what this bird is called? This is the largest of the North American herons called the great blue heron with long legs, sinuous neck, and thick dagger-like bill. In flight and at rest, the great blue heron curls its neck into a tight S shape. Great blue herons appear blue-gray from a distance with a wide black stripe over the eye. You can see them throughout the summer at the Bashak Hill, but you have to look closely because they remain very still while they're fishing. Can you find the great blue heron in this picture? The blue-gray color and the shape of its body makes it very easy for the gray blue heron to camouflage in a wetland that is surrounded by trees. You must have a very keen eye and a lot of patience in order to see most of the life here. This bird is called an American bittern. They are medium-sized herons with thick, compact bodies. They have shorter legs and thicker necks than typical herons and a slightly hunched posture. American bitterns are mostly warm brown, buff, and white. They are strongly streaked, especially on the neck, and they can be very hard to see against marsh vegetation. They are so well camouflaged that they are often only heard. The sound bite that you hear, uh, you'll hear some noise in the beginning. You have to wait a little bit, and when you hear like a thumping sound, that's the sound of the bittern. This is an American wood duck, one of our most colorful birds. Look for wood ducks around the edges of swamps, sluggish streams, overgrown beaver ponds, and wood fringed marshes. Males are iridescent chestnut and green, 
with ornate patterns on nearly every feather. The elegant female has a distinctive profile and delicate white pattern around the eye. Wood ducks, along with black ducks, were the main reason the Bashkill became a wildlife management area to protect their habitat. Wood ducks live in wooded swamps where they nest in holes in trees or in nest boxes put up around lake margins. They are one of the few duck species equipped with strong claws that can grip bark and perch on branches. The young must jump from their high nests hours after being born and make it to the water. People used to wonder how they survived the fall, which can be quite high. It turns out that the jolt from the fall helps get their lungs going. I know you all know that this is our bald eagle. Nationwide, bald eagles are most widespread during winter, where they can be found along coasts, rivers, lakes, and reservoirs in many states. We are lucky enough to live in an area that they can be seen most of the year. They only migrate to where there is open water. The Bashakil currently has two nesting pairs of eagles, one at the north end, which can be seen from, the ha from Haven Road, and one at the south end, which can be seen from the boat launch further down on South Road. Can you guess what kind of bird this is? This is actually an immature bald eagle. Bald eagles do not get their distinctive white head and tail until they are about five to seven years old. In the meantime, they have this mottled look about them, which is a mess of dark and white feathers. Sometimes they just look like they've just woken up in the morning, uh, feathers everywhere. Uh, but it takes about seven years for them to get their adult plumage and to start nesting. This bird is called an osprey or fish hawk. They are brown above and white below, and overall they are whiter than most other raptors. Ospreys are unusual among hawks because they have a reversible outer toe that allows them to grasp fish with two toes in front and two toes behind. Barbed pads on the soles of the bird's feet also help them grip slippery fish. They are unique in that they hold fish parallel with their body for a mo more aerodynamic flight. This is what an osprey looks like in flight. You can see that their bodies and their underwings are very white with some gray modeling on the wings. This makes them very distinct from other raptors in flight and easy to, easy to identify. This is a northern banded water snake. They are fairly dark colored snakes and may be brown, tan, or grayish to almost black. They are often mistaken for cottonmouths, which are not found in New York. They are non-venomous, but can be aggressive if threatened. You can often see them basking in the sun on the sides of the trail. If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. This is an Eastern garter snake. There are two theories about why they are called a garter snake. The first is that their stripes resemble the garters that used to hold up men's socks in the old days. The second theory is that it is a corruption of the German word for garden. I suspect that the second is more true since most people call it a garden snake anyway. They have a very sweet disposition. They're excellent garden companions as they eat mice, moles, voles, and other garden enemies. This is a painted turtle. Painted turtles are the most common and widely spread turtles in North America. They are found from southern Canada to northern Mexico and all across the United States. They're called painted turtles because of all this beautiful coloring found on their shells. If you walk the trails of the Bashakil, you can see them sunning themselves in groups on fallen logs in the water. This is a red-eared slider. They're called red-eared sliders because of the red spot behind their ears. They're one of the most common turtles in the market in the US. They're native to Asia. They are horrible competitors to painted turtles because people have released their unwanted pets into the wild and they compete for food and habitat. Can you tell which one of these turtles is the painted turtle and which is the red-eared slider? This is the common snapping turtle. The snapping turtle family evolved in North America and has haunted our wetlands almost unchanged for 90 million years. They are the top predator in the aquatic food chain of the Bashakil. 
The only animals that threaten this prehistoric reptile are those that prey on the eggs and juvenile turtles. This is usually raccoons, skunks, possums, and sometimes otters. The only other threat to snapping turtles are, of course, humans. They often get hit by cars when they're crossing the road to lay their eggs. Now we're going to talk about dragonflies and damselflies. The Bashakil has one of the most diverse groups of dragonflies and damselflies in the northeastern United States. While closely related, they are two very distinct species. They are both in the order Odonata, which means toothed ones. There are 5,000 different species in this order, with a third of them being damselflies. This is how you tell them apart. Damselflies are smaller and more delicate looking, and they fly less swiftly. Secondly, at rest, dragonflies hold their wings out flat, while damselflies hold them back above their bodies. Third, the eyes of dragonflies meet at the tops of their heads. Damselflies are widely spread and do not touch. They have been on the earth for more than 300 million years and some prehistorically were as big as a hawk. Both damsels and dragons are ferocious hunters as nymphs and adults. Both have hinged lower lip called the labium, which they can shoot out like a dart and grab their unsuspecting prey. As adults, they capture prey in midair using their legs, which are covered in small bristles like a basket to catch it. They do not use their legs for walking, only for perching and catching prey. Both damsels and dragons are found throughout the world, except for Antarctica, and come in just about every color. See how many different colors you can spot while you're walking the Bashakil. Next, we'll talk about the Lepidoptera family, or butterflies and moths. There are about 180,000 species of butterflies and moths in the world. Nearly all butterfly and moth caterpillars eat the leaves and flowers of plants. A few caterpillars are carnivores, meaning they eat meat or other bugs. Adults mostly drink nectar and sap. There are about 372 species of butterflies and moths in New York State. Two ways to tell the difference between butterflies and moths are that butterflies usually rest with their wings closed while moths rest with their wings open. In this slide, most of the butterflies have their wings open and I chose those so that you could see the different colors. The other way to tell the difference is that butterflies have long, thin antenna with little clubs at the end, while moths have shorter, feathery antennas. Butterflies and moths help to pollinate the flowers that grow in the marsh while they are feeding on nectar. In return, they serve as food to birds, snakes, small mammals, and reptiles. Butterflies and moths use all kinds of interesting tricks to avoid predation. Some are poisonous, like the monarch. Some are masterful mimics, such as caterpillars that look like twigs and butterflies that look like the bark of a tree. I'm sure you notice that the viceroy butterfly looks a lot like the monarch. They have adapted or changed through the years to look like monarchs so that they don't get eaten, even though they are not poisonous. Other use startle markings to distract pursuing predators. Doesn't the pattern on the pearl crescent butterfly look like a mean face? Moths tend to get less attention than butterflies, but here are some fun facts about them. There are more moths in the world than butterflies. Most moths are nocturnal, but many fly during the day. Most come in all sizes from two millimeters to the size of a dinner plate. Male moths have a remarkable sense of smell. Their sense of smell is only used to find a mate, but moths do not have noses. They smell with their antenna. Some moths are important pollinators. While butterflies get all the credit, there are plenty of moths moving pollen from flower to flower at night. Yucca plants require the help of a yucca moth to cross-pollinate their flowers, 
and each yucca plant species has its own moth partner. Some moths do not have mouths. Some moths don't waste time once they reach adulthood. They emerge from their cocoons ready to mate and die soon after. Since they won't be around very long, they can get by on the energy they stored as caterpillars. Probably the best known example of a mouthless moth is the luna moth, a stunning species that lives just a few days as an adult. Monarchs aren't the only migrators. Some moths do too. Moths tend to migrate from, for practical reasons, like to find better food supply or to avoid uncomfortably hot and dry weather. If you are interested in the moths in your area, check out your porch light. Some moths might not come to light, but can't resist a mixture of fermenting sweets. You can mix up a special moth attracting recipe using ripe bananas, molasses, and stale beer. Paint the mixture on a few tree trunks and see who comes for a taste. Now we'll move on to some reptiles. This is the American bullfrog. The American bullfrog is the largest of all North American frogs. After hatching, they can remain as tadpoles for one to three or more years, depending on conditions. Frogs play a central role in many ecosystems. They control the insect population and they're a food store source for many larger animals. This is the northern leopard frog. I think you can figure out why it's named that. They are greenish brown in color with a pearly white underside and light colored ridges on either side of their backs. They are considered medium size, reaching lengths of three to five inches, nose to rump. Females are slightly larger than the males. Leopard frogs will eat just about anything they can fit in their mouths. They sit still and wait for prey to happen by, then pounce with their powerful legs. They eat beetles, ants, flies, worms, smaller frogs, including their own species, and even birds and garter snakes. If you thought to yourself, that's a salamander, you were right. This salamander is called an Eastern Newt. Newts are a kind of salamander. Many people think that red efts and eastern newts are different species, but they are actually different life phases of the same species. This newt has three phases in its life cycle. The larva, which lives in the water, the eft, which lives on the land, and the newt, which returns to the water. They can live up to 15 years. All salamanders are essential to keeping insect and arthropod populations in balance. This is a valuable service to humans as salamanders act as a natural form of pest control. These pests include ticks and mosquitoes. They are also considered an indicator species. That means that if they are present in an area, it indicates or shows that the land or water is healthy. Next, let's talk about some woodland mammals that are found around the Bashik Hill. Red foxes are often confused with gray foxes, which share a similar habitat. This can make identification difficult because some red foxes can have large patches of gray and gray foxes have patches of red fur. Gray foxes are somewhat smaller and have a slightly more rounded face and shorter snout. The best way to tell the difference is to look for the color at the tip of the tail. Gray foxes have black tipped tails while red foxes are white. Although they are very similar in name and appearance, the gray fox and the red fox are only distant cousins. When frightened, skunks will shoot a smelly oily substance from a gland underneath their tails with a range of up to 10 feet. Skunks are actually extremely shy and will avoid confrontation at all costs. Producing and excreting their spray uses a lot of energy, so they only do it when they absolutely have to. They will first either run away or stamp their feet. Their diet consists of plants, insects, worms, fruit, eggs, reptiles, small mammals, and fish. The North American porcupine is the largest rodent in North America, beat out only by the beaver. Porcupines use their quills as a defense. 
They may shake them, which makes them rattle as a warning to potential predators. If that doesn't work, they may charge backwards into the predator. The quills are loose, loosely attached but cannot be thrown or projected. Possums are America's only marsupial, one of the oldest species of mammal around having roamed with dinosaurs. They eat whatever they find, including grubs and insects and even mice, working over the environment like little vacuum cleaners. They are tick magnets and eat up to 5,000 ticks per year each. Playing possum is a defense mechanism after hissing and drool doesn't work. They actually become almost comatose and cannot snap out of it at will. This could last from five minutes to four hours. The American black bear is the smallest of the three bear species found in North America. Black bear fur is usually all one color, except for a brown muzzle and light markings that sometimes appear on their chests. Western populations of black bear often show brown, cinnamon, and blonde coloration in addition to black. Black bears will eat almost anything. They are omnivores, meaning that they eat both plants and animals. Black bears have short, non-retractable claws that give them an excellent tree climbing ability. That means that they cannot pull their claws in like a cat does. They are very smart and can identify food not only by smell, but also by appearance. Bears spend their winter months in dens to avoid the cold weather and lack of available food. They make their dens in hollow trees or logs under the root mass of a tree in rock crevices, or even high in a tree in warmer climates. Bears may spend up to six months in hibernation, during which they do not eat, drink, or expel waste. During the winter denning period, pregnant black bears will give birth to cubs. Cubs are born in the middle of winter denning period, usually between mid-January and early February. Cubs are born tiny, helpless, and hairless, weighing less than half a pound. A mother bear will typically give birth to one to three cubs at a time. Sometimes she may even have four. By the time a mother bear and her cubs are ready to emerge into spring, the, club, the cubs typically weigh about five pounds. Young bears grow very quickly and can weigh up to 80 pounds by their first birthdays. Cubs will remain with their mothers for about 18 months or until she is ready to mate again. The coyote appears often in the tales and traditions of Native Americans, usually as a very savvy and clever animal. Modern coyotes have displayed their cleverness by adapting to the changing American landscape. These members of the dog family once lived primarily in open prairies and deserts, but now they roam the continents, forests, and mountains, taking the place of the wolf. These adaptable animals will eat almost anything. They hunt rabbits, rodents, fish, frogs, and even deer. Coyotes are formidable in the field where they can enjoy a keen sense of vision and a strong sense of smell. They can run up to 40 miles an hour. In the fall and winter, they form packs for more effective hunting. Coyotes form strong family groups. And in the spring, females den and give birth to litters of three to 12 pups. Both parents feed and protect their young and their territory. The pups are able to hunt on their own by the following fall. If you run across a coyote or a bear, please be careful as they can be very dangerous. Do not feed them or let your pets run loose in areas where they can be found. If you encounter a coyote or a bear, do not run, do not turn your back on them. Back away slowly, or if you feel threatened, wave your arms and make lots of noise. This should scare them away. Now let's talk about some mammals that are found in and around the water. Mink are dark colored, semi-aquatic carnivorous mammals related to weasels and otters.
The American mink is a carnivore that feeds on rodents, fish, shellfish, frogs, and birds. Minks are found near bodies of water such as streams, lakes, or ponds that have nearby tree cover. They make their home by digging dens or by living in hollow logs. They often make their dens a little cozier by adding grass, leaves, or fur left over from prey. The North American river otter is the only otter species not facing population decline on a large scale. Their presence in local streams and rivers is a clue of a healthy habitat, an abundance of food, including fish, and clean water. River otters are incredible swimmers. They can dive up to 60 feet and stay underwater for as long as four minutes, but they aren't born with those skills. In fact, baby river otters or puffs can't swim at all. They are buoyant, so they don't drown in the water, but they have to learn to swim from their moms, just like us. Beavers are North America's largest rodent and the second largest rodent in the world. Do you know what the fir first largest is? I encourage you to look it up. It is difficult to visit any body of water in Sullivan and Orange counties without finding some evidence of beavers. They are so amazing that I have included a link to a very fun video about them. If the link does not work, go to pbs.org and search the smartest thing in fur pants. It's worth watching. The Bashakil is highly unique, both ecologically and in beauty. Wetlands, however, are extremely fragile and easily degraded by unwise use and development. It is very important for all of us to be vigilant of our own behavior while visiting, as well as the actions of our government and prospective developers to ensure that this gem is protected indefinitely. It is up to us to take care of our own backyards. I hope you enjoyed this video today, and I really hope that you all are able to come and visit the Mamakating Environmental Education and Interpretive Center in Wartsboro on the Bashak Hill when you can. Uh, please walk our trail soon and follow us on Facebook um, to find out when we open again to the public. I hope to see you soon, and I hope, to, uh, hope that you'll comment in the comments below. Everybody be well.